Over the past decade, a major movement has taken place in cardiology, where patients who in the past would have had an open heart procedure now are having less invasive procedures. For example, going from a quadruple bypass to four drug-coated stents to uh, open valve replacement to a minimally invasive valve replacement. To talk with us more about it is Dr. John LaSala. He is Chief of Interventional Cardiology at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. LaSala, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. You've said your profession is one of the most exciting in medicine. How have things changed for patients facing heart surgery over the past decade? Well, for about 30 years now, we've had the option of doing coronary angioplasty. Uh, previously, this was under the province of a cardiac surgeon. People who had developed severe angina or chest tightness, discomfort, could only be benefited by medication or actually having a bypass. But since Andreas Grenzig's work in 1977, balloon angioplasty, and now as we moved into the 90s and 2000s, the opportunity of having a stent place, uh, most recently with a drug coating to help prevent, prevent restenosis, the renarrowing that can take place, gives patients a lot of different options as far as how to treat their blockages in the coronary tree. What procedures are you able to do percutaneously now that you weren't able to do in the past? Well, we started with the coronaries. That was the first uh, area that we were able to show that there are substitutes or alternatives to surgery. We then began to move into the field of what's called structural heart disease. That could be related to any holes that you might have that have been born with in the heart or abnormalities with the heart valves themselves. So I started some seven, eight years ago to close uh, defects inside of the heart you know, without using any type of surgery. We were able to, for the past 20 years or so, open up heart valves that were stuck, usually as a result of scar tissue from old rheumatic fever. That's been available to us for quite a while. But most recently, over the past couple years, we now have several other new options to approach heart valves. One is to actually repair a leaky heart valve, the mitral valve, using a clip that actually takes the two leaflets of the valve and pinches them together so that they no longer can sort of flop in the breeze and cause a leakiness of blood. And now the most recent and potentially the most exciting of all uh, is taking the aortic valve, which uh, is frozen for a different reason, usually the buildup of calcium and plaque, and going through that uh, valve that no longer function and opens normally, replacing it with a stent-like construct, but inside that stent is a new valve which begins to take over immediately for the replaced valve. Now, when you were talking about the percutaneous valve replacement, you're referring to the PARTNER trial. Uh, talk a bit about that. Well, the PARTNER trial is a rather groundbreaking trial. There are two cohorts. One are people that uh, cannot have surgery under any circumstances to replace their aortic valve. These people, despite you know, our best medical efforts, will probably not survive very long. Maybe as many as half of them might not survive two years. We now can go in and uh, if they meet the qualifications of the trial, uh, go in, open up the previous valve and then replace it with the same stent construct that has a new tissue valve inside. The second cohort is somebody who is, uh, they're still surgical candidates, but they're very high in terms of their overall mortality, perhaps 10% or higher for the initial surgical approach. And they are being randomized to either traditional surgery, open chest, replacing the valve, versus the same type of partner valve. Over the next five to 10 years, do you see that procedure taking the place of a regular open valve procedure? Well, I believe that right now we're approaching patients that either have no options or the options have certain strings attached, like the high mortality. Down the road, as the technology improves, in other words, it gets smaller, more user-friendly, and shows that it has longevity. This will take several generations of change in the current types of uh, devices we have, but at some point, we could show that these percutaneous valves may last 15, 20 years or longer. Then, potentially, you can compete with the traditional valve that a surgeon would put in, and it may become the main form of therapy. What sort of benefit would this offer patients? Well, the biggest difference, of course, between surgery and what we could do interventionally, whether it's replacing valves or doing multiple angioplasties at various sites that might undergo bypass surgery, is that it's, it's not surgery. There's no cutting involved. There's no sutures. There's no generally intubation, you know, general anesthesia. The recovery times are much shorter. 
and the complication times are also much, uh, much lower. So the, right up front, the immediate benefit is that your patient is back out within a day or two. They can go back to their jobs in a couple days. They don't have a prolonged recovery time, and they don't have the same complication rate. Our biggest, uh, if you will, hurdle is to show that we can be as long-lasting as what surgery can provide, particularly when it comes to coronary disease. If you have right now, you know, three blockages in the major three arteries, we can do as good a job as far as removing the threat of death or a recurrent heart attack, but you are more likely to come back and see us again for a repeat procedure compared to if you went to surgery. And that's the number we really have to improve right now with regard to coronary angioplasty. Overall, what should a patient know before they visit with their physician if they need heart surgery? The things that people want to know when they go into either a bypass, a valve replacement, or any form of percutaneous therapy is, you know, what is the track record of the institution? What is the experience of the operators involved? What do they cite as their numbers in terms of complications and success rates? And just where they stand in that spectrum. Those numbers represent an average. What does it mean to you? Are you a relatively low risk case? Are you somebody who has significant uh, confounding variables that might lead to you being a higher risk case? And then sort of weighing them as to which way you want to go. There's clearly a gray area where we can't always say, you know, this person would do better with angioplasty, this person would do better with bypass surgery, but there's a group right in between where we don't really know which way to go. Then we take into sort of the in, into consideration the intangibles. What is the patient's preference? Do they look hardy enough to withstand an operation? Um, what is the track record of the individuals involved? Some are more aggressive than others and willing to take on tougher cases. Perhaps they could avoid surgery that way. Are you willing to come back, you know, if there is a need for a repeat procedure? How well can you take medications? Is it socioeconomically uh, infeasible for you to do that? Um, are you reliable enough patient to be able to take those medications? These are kind of the variables that fall into the mix when we start looking at patients that are right there in the gray area. And there are some trials coming up in the next year or two that we're participating in that might shed some light on it, but it's always going to be the judgment call of the physician working individually, patient by patient, with what's going to be the best form of therapy for them. Uh, before we go, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, as I usually close off most of my statements, um, most of the things we're doing right now I could have never predicted 10 years ago. So uh, the beauty of being in this particular field of interventional cardiology is that there's a lot of bright minds, a lot of uh, very creative engineers, and a lot of collaboration between we as practitioners and being in a teaching institution, a research institution, that we can begin to uh, serve as the bridge as these new devices, these new technologies get into the mainstream of therapy. And for me, that's really been the most uh, fundamentally satisfying of all. Dr. LaSalle, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here. And for more information about interventional cardiology, you can go to our website, www.barnesjewish.org, or call 866-TOP-DOCS. That's 866-867-3627.